new faces as well. Uh, Professor Eichelman's lecture this afternoon is sponsored primarily by the Institute for the Study of Muslim Societies and Civilizations, with a little bit of help from the, uh, the Institute for Iraqi Studies as well. Um, Professor Eichelman is, in a word, or in a few words, I should say, um, arguably the top anthropologist of his generation working on the Middle East. Uh, he has accumulated a remarkable number of publications. He's worked in a number of different interesting locales. Uh, he's well known for his early work in Morocco and the book Moroccan Islam. And a, a lot of work on Oman. He's done some work in Syria. Uh, he's basically been back and forth across the region many times. Many of you, particularly perhaps graduate students, but many others of us as well, will be very familiar with this book, The Middle Eastern Anthropological Approach, which is now in its fourth edition, coming out in the fifth edition before too long ago. That book alone is a testament to his command of the field. Uh, it's uh, hard to believe that one person can put that much uh, analysis and that much by way of contextualization of the uh, down in, in one book. He's done a remarkable job really surveying uh, literatures across the study of the Middle East from anthropology as well as from other disciplines, history, sociology, and political science in some cases. Uh, he's well known for his uh, book co-authored with James Piscatore, Muslim Politics. Uh, he also has uh, published two editions of a volume on New Media, which he co-edited with John Anderson, in which some of us in this room have actually contributed to. Uh, he's also done important service by way of bringing uh, important voices from the Middle East to the attention of Middle East scholars. For example, uh, he wrote a uh, really definitive introductory essay on the writing of Muhammad Shafur, the Syrian reformist thinker. He uh, has had a considerable interaction with Fatula Gulan, the important uh, Turkish uh, uh, social movement and religious leader. Uh, this is a man who works tirelessly. Uh, almost everything, if not everything, he produces is positively first rate. He's also very active in the promotion of scholarship by younger scholars. You find evidence of that in the series that uh, he and Jim Piscatore began the Muslim Politics series at Princeton University Press. Uh, I'm privileged to now be co-editor of that series now that Jim Piscatore stepped aside. And, uh, and you find in that series a number of uh, fine works by established scholars, but also plenty of room for younger scholars, and that's very much testimony to uh, Dale's uh, 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 commitment to uh, giving younger scholars voice uh, and opportunity. Uh, I've been privileged to know Dale um, from well before the Dartmouth days. We first became acquainted in the early 1980s when he was still at New York University before he was attracted away by, by Dartmouth. And uh, he's been a long-standing uh, friend and colleague. Um, I've read uh, all of his work. My own favorite is, uh, is it Power? What is the book, the 1985 book? No, Knowledge. Knowledge and Power, uh, which you uh, kindly gave me a copy of, I think, in 1986. Uh, I read in one sitting a really marvelous account of a Qadi, an Islamic judge, uh, who has in some ways watched life or at least modernity overtake him in the Moroccan context, very much reflecting on his work in, uh, in Islamic jurisprudence and the administration of, of, uh, of justice in society. Um, Dale has been asked to reflect on a field work in the Middle East, not just in the context of the sort of post, quote, Arab Spring period, uh, but also to, uh, to offer some ruminations and reflections on the place of your work in uh, the study uh, of the Middle East for anthropologists. So with that, 
without further ado, it is a great pleasure to turn to the podium of which we are like. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you very much, Dick. It's a pleasure to return to Boston University. Uh, it seems I've been returning to Boston University for well over two decades in one way or another because this is one of the more lively places in the Boston area for anybody interested in the Middle East uh, uh, or, for that matter, in the Islamic world. Uh, Boston University may not have quite the same resources as certain institutions across the river, uh, but it has more projects that end up in publication than just about anywhere else. Usually I come here and I just go into a sealed room and uh, talk with other people. And we start doing pre-editing. This time I'm pleased to see that it's an unsealed room to the best of my knowledge, uh, and, which gives us something else. Uh, to do. Um, I am going to talk about field work. Um, I, uh, there's no secret to why my formal title is the Arab Spring in Social Anthropology, the last half century. Uh, this presentation pretty well marks my half century of doing field work in the Middle East. You know, there's an old article that may still be used by graduate students by Sherry Ortner, Anthropology in the 1960s, came out for footnote for those of you who don't read 1984 things when it came out. Um, uh, Sherry said that the way we look at our field is what it looked like when we entered it, to which I would add a coda, when you enter it, how do you know where anthropology's been? Answer usually by the lectures that your senior faculty give, the brainwashing lectures of early graduate studies, and those usually are from the prior generation when they themselves were trained. This certainly is the case for my own instructors at the University of Chicago, Barney Cohn, Clifford Gertz, and others. But um, let me begin with the sense of humility that calls anthropologists, like just about everybody else, are asked to give instant readings on things such as the Arab Spring. Although, I, perhaps later some of you can tell me, um, what I'm noticing on my campus, like yours, is while there's quite a bit of excitement and feedback on things such as uh, our involvement, the American involvement, or I'm sorry, the Coalition of Willings involvement in uh, uh, liberating Iraq, uh, and in what's been happening in Egypt and Tunisia, I barely hear a murmur about Syria right now. Uh, perhaps it's different in Boston. Please tell me if that's the case, but I'm not hearing very much elsewhere. But there's a saying from uh, Lenin, not a card carrying anthropologist, attributed to him at least in the 1920s. There's decades when nothing happens, but there's weeks when decades happen, and that's certainly been the case in perceptions and in action and substance for the last um, uh, for the last year and a half, at least since uh, December 2010 uh, in the Middle East. So, you know, to serve as kind of markers for what I'm going to say, I guess lesson number one that we can have um, looking ahead to the first part of my talk is to say that. Predictions are very hard to come by. Um, if you think you're getting astonishing insight from me in this talk, I'm going to begin to disappoint you because that's the best I can do. Uh, uh, but it bears repetition because quite often anthropologists and others are called upon to do exactly that. Uh, and uh, sometimes we aspire. Uh, I have, since I was a graduate student sometimes, to think a little bit ahead, and this is the Auguste Comte part of anthropology and the social sciences. We try to think about um, how we might engineer or advise people to make things at least a little bit better in the future, and we often get very humbled by that. So let's just take a look at the record of some, to make it very quickly. A scholar in the mid-80s of neighboring Boston area university uh, conducted a major project, uh, project with his graduate students 
uh, that garnered about $450,000 from the U.S. government agency and confidential funding, and just under that amount from the Rockefeller Foundation, because if you have confidential funding, you don't have to bother telling other people that you're doing the same thing, perhaps. I know I'm on record, so I have to kind of watch that bit, but not much. Um, for a while, I had a little side income by making presentations to university professors on the ethics of funding. Uh, and it's all dried up now because <laughs> the times have changed. Um, but in 1985, um, first result of this study was to produce a report saying that a major Arabian Peninsula country would be politically stable for the next five years unless it was not. Um, it's, that prediction has come true. Um, Hafez al-Assad died in June 2000, recently retired, uh, a friend recently retired from a senior government post, told me last year when I was being very uh, reticent to be exuberant about the Arab Spring in and of itself, uh, told me that the inside world in Washington in June 2000 was that Bashar al-Assad would last no longer than four months. Um, okay, that's prediction number two. Okay, um, we've seen a number of prior shifts where we have asserted, or Arab intellectuals have asserted, that the world has irrevocably changed. Uh, think of Sadiq al-Assad and many others after the uh, Israeli Arab War or June 1967, um, saying that this has ushered in an era of self-criticism, of politics, of society, and everything else. Brilliant analyses of where Arabs were, and I leave you to decide whether in the Arab world or elsewhere the major catastrophe uh, uh, brought about any su substantive change. In 1989, uh, one had the fall of the Eastern German government and a whole cascade of events in the Soviet Union uh, and the Eastern States thereafter. Um, one of uh, Robert Adams, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, who still is an archaeologist going into Iraq, uh, <coughs> mentioned to me that people who never spoke politics before to him, senior people in the back government, were saying, I guess we're next. Well, they weren't, were they? Um, at least at least not right away. And the point again is not to try to, uh, is, is to be perhaps much more reticent about predicting the future. September 11, 2001 changed everything, or at least that was the hat phrase that kept being repeated for about a decade. Uh, and now we have, alas, the Arab Spring begun with the tragic public wish um, immolation of Mohammed Bouazizi in southern Tunisia and exacerbated later by lots of things. Remember the video clip? It must still be on YouTube too. The video clip of uh, the ex-president of Tunisia coming to his bedside, which um, uh, wasn't quite the thing to do. For many of us, the first part of the Arab Spring, we thought, ah, this is finally showing these changes, person, ideas of person, politics, uh, and society, and reinforcing that even despotic regimes are perhaps much more frail than they appear to be. From the Sultanate of Oman, usually referred to as a place I've worked a lot, uh, the Omanis hate this phrase, the rather somnolent Sultanate of Oman, Omanis really do try to stay away in 140 degree heat, uh, to Syria, to Jordan, to Tunisia. Terms such as dignity have become as common as the familiar frame, uh, 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 refrain of wanting meaningful employment and the chance to play a role in one's, one's government. Um, a lot of these shifts are going to be visible only in retrospect, and some of them may not be very substantive um, uh, shifts at all. As Mark Bloch wrote over 80 years ago, before he got shot by the Germans, 
uh, generations involved in creating new social forms are unaware often that they're doing so. And if something new is created, it's often in the process of trying to readapt, to adapt the old or to reestablish it. Now, Arab Spring itself is a term that has primary resonance in several European languages because it's 1968 antecedent is, of course, the Prague Spring, which began in January that year. And you'll recall that by August 1968, after a period of quietness where everybody thought this is it, democracy is just around the corner, the Soviet military crushed the Prague Spring. Um, the 2011 Arab Spring may also be reversible, but in a very different climate, where people are going to talk a lot more in public, at least while they're able to talk in public, and then they'll find other ways. The analogy, for all of its frailty, is nonetheless, I think, as Claude Levi Strauss would have said, really good to think with. It suggests a family resemblance that gets us out of just thinking about the Middle East and these, these garbage can terms like, well, Arabs love authoritarian rule because it's in their nature, or certain religion has it in its nature, just about anything else. I'm no longer certain about inevitability of the turn toward democracy because so many other things are going on. Uh, I live in a country where it seems that the money put into television advertisements sways voters and polls on a very short-term basis as opposed to thinking of substantive issues. Of course, I'm not telling you where I live. I live in New Hampshire, so it's a different place than you. So I'm spared other things. Uh, but it does remind us, our own experience reminds us that we're not on an upward slope where democracy is all that easy. It means each step of the way having to figure out what it means, how we're working on it, uh, whether we're a quote advanced society with the high level political discussions that we have in this country or whether we're a more backward society that hasn't achieved the level of television advertisements that we have managed to, 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 to do for ourselves. Now, anybody talking about the Arab Spring is going to talk about a number of long-term things. And here, I could pretend to be in comparative literature, sociology, political science, is anything you want. <clears throat> Most of the population in the Arab Middle East is young. And of course, that's true for a lot of other places in the world, too. But let's forget it. I'm just talking about the Middle East, right? Um, there was a very, very senior uh, member of the Moroccan government who said to me uh, last September that it's going to get easier for us beginning in 2015 because we already know how many people are born and fewer people are being born so there'll be less of a political crisis. Yeah, good luck. Um, uh, the one thing we know from what he said is that there will be a lower birth rate for Morocco. After that, I would not be so exuberant about anything else because the population is still really significantly under or unemployed. Emigration long ago seized to be the safety valve that it was for a long time. Secondly, the region is much better schooled. It may not be good schooling, but uh, as uh, a major economist, uh, American economist said not very long ago, um, you know, the United States has significantly disinvested in primary, secondary, and tertiary education for quite some time now, so that our lead in education may be increasingly eroded. Nonetheless, the region is much better school. A lot more people from the Arab world can talk back in the sort of Arabic you hear on newscasts and so forth, which you have to use if you're talking in public, whether it's in Kuwait or Morocco or somewhere else. Third, and I'll say it in a sentence, is the greater accessibility of new media. And new media, when, when I last edited a book on it, now are very much old media, because now one can tweet Twit, or whatever it is, obviously. I'm not part of that particular generation. And do a lot of things, and governments, for better or worse, can catch up. 
even the Syrians can buy state-of-the-art equipment from American companies and uh, uh, use them for their purposes. So what goes on in virtual reality is the same. In case you were wondering, a lot of media, one of the news channels reported today that Bashar al-Assad's a good family man and uh, he's got nothing to do with any of these, these bad rumors you're hearing about stuff going on in Syria. Everything's calm. Uh, he does have some military role, but he doesn't know anything about all these disturbances. Sure. Now, there's a prediction that I just read very, very recently, like today, um, from uh, the National, the United Arab Emirates, which beautifully made uh, for my presentation, in which uh, the World Bank manager for education initiatives in the Middle East said that if one had higher education standards in the Middle East, the Arab Spring would never have occurred because everybody would be employed. So you get that reasoning that this is brilliant rocket science to me. Uh, if you have the right sort of education, you're going to be employed, and therefore you won't have time to revolt or be revolting or anything else. Yeah. Um, the, to be more deadpan, um, I do appreciate the attempt to have an immediate cause and effect relationship between education and politics, but um, I think it would be more complicated. Uh, one of your graduate students, formerly one of my undergraduates, Chloe Mulderi, sticks more to what anthropologists will do. She had a marvelously titled thing published here at Boston University called Adulthood Denied, in which she tries to capture the tone, as anthropologists sometimes do, of what it's like to be unemployed and with an education that leads to nothing except a diploma probably produced on a photocopy machine. That's my imagination, I hope not. The familiar statistics she does, just as I would do or anybody else, uh, but getting the tone right in a few words to have people think about things is fine. Okay, that being said, what difference can anthropology make? And what is it that at least social anthropologists are doing now, uh, let's talk about the meaning of field work. Mafhum al-aql al-amal, I suppose. Um, once upon a time, like when I began teaching anthropology, I was told that field work was proprietary to anthropology. Even when I first heard that, I regard that as patent nonsense. Um, uh, it is central to social anthropology. Uh, but one often gets really brilliant work by people who aren't anthropologists using the same book tool. Look at Jim Scott at Yale University, uh, for example, who had a very, uh, who in my judgment anyway, has perhaps a broader reach in looking at the way political scientists talk, but of, of doing uh, much more with it. Uh, your department has, I don't want to single anyone out by name, a former military officer with a degree in political science. Uh, and I believe he's made substantive contributions to anthropology. I regard them as such, and I regard that uh, his having conducted field work even before he uh, became an anthropologist. Franz Boas certainly didn't have a degree in anthropology, but he's one of the founding fathers unless you become too emotional about Mr. Boas, keep in mind that the American Anthropological Association expelled him, or rather censured him, in 1919 because he suggested that anthropology conducted out of the Peabody Museum should not be used to conduct espionage in World War I, and that was regarded as wrong. But to show you how our national organizations really keep up with these things and shift with the times, uh, he, the censure was rescinded in 2005. <laughs> so um, if you ever get censured, there's hopes. Robert Redfield um, had a degree in law and did, I think, founded the field. So, okay, point made. 
Now, when I entered the field, talking about, I arrived in anthropology at Chicago, University of Chicago, with some baggage. I had two years of Islamic and Arabic studies uh, from, in a degree from the Guild University. My other baggage was something that no longer exists. I had a merit-based National Science Foundation fellowship to pursue graduate studies. Uh, that program ceased to exist by the 70s. And those of you who are graduate students, I feel for you because I know the sort of resources you compete for, and it's always incomplete and it's always partial. Uh, once upon a time in the politics of this great country, and after the Sputnik era, we had some great U.S. senators who were not spending most of their time competing for campaign funds, such as J. William Fulbright. And one of the things they did after the launch of Sputnik was to brilliantly to coin the notion, the idea of the National Defense Education Act. Um, the issue, the things they supported could not be immediately tied to national defense, but that was the way that they could make a major infusion into everything from the teaching of math and physics in elementary and secondary schools to the promotion of the study of, quote, exotic foreign languages. Never mind that a sociologist at uh, Princeton University at the time said, well, we have to have uh, money to uh, you have to give scholarships people to learn Arabic because the Arabic language has no literature. Um, at Moral Berger, in case anybody wonders, well, um, uh, he was one of the leaders of the field of Middle East studies at the same time. Um, uh, and I would, you know, honestly say maybe he was wrong. Uh, but in terms of national funding to train people well, in order to assess situations and work in a variety of circumstances, I would say that I hope the day comes when we can regain what we've lost. The Japanese, despite their economic problems, still can support long-term research. The French are doing an exceedingly good job of doing the same thing. So are the Swiss. There's fewer of them than us, I suppose. Um, uh, the Brits, let's pass over in silence. Okay, they've got different problems. Uh, we could still go back and do a lot, uh, but we have. Now, going back to 1966, although I've just set this, the scene for it, I hope, uh, I had an entry class of 30. Um, we were there, so said the chair of the department at the time, so that they, the faculty, could separate the sheep from the goats. I wasn't aware, as Charles Lindholm might say, that there was so much pastoralism in anthropology uh, at the time. Um, there was more than a whiff of authoritarianism in the air. A little bit later, one of my colleagues, Judith Friedlander, who by the name you might be able to discern her gender, um, did a very basic study and got hold of some figures and um, uh, noticed that there was a huge dropout rate of women between year one and year two of graduate studies. And when this was brought to the attention of faculty, the faculty uh, 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 said, well, you know, that's why we don't give fellowship support to women because they drop out. And Judith's answer was, could it possibly be because they can't afford to stay in? Answer, we hadn't thought about that. Okay, so it was slightly different. Um, I do recall a class in which one of my esteemed student colleagues asked, what was structuralism? And the reply was, if you're asking such a question, you don't belong at the University of Chicago which um, is pedagogical techniques to use at Boston University. Try that today. I don't think the answer, I think the answer would be something more than silence. But field work was not taught, and this is my main point. Field work was another thing that if you had asked how to do it, maybe you shouldn't be an anthropologist. Nobody ever said that. Uh, but nobody taught a course in it, and nobody built in any sense of how one was supposed to do field work. 
so you absorbed it from introductions to books. So 1967, we graduate students took matters into our own hands and organized an off the book seminar on the theme of field work and what we could gather. It was memorable. Of course, we didn't invite in people that we had there. Raymond Firth, who died after about a century in 2002, with his experience in the Solomon Islands, Tikopia, uh, we all, I think, still read them, <coughs> talked about us as if it were only yesterday it was really 1928 that he went to Tikopia. And with no sense of humor, he said that the proper field worker should have all their teeth extracted before they go to the field, because otherwise you get that toothache and there goes your field research. So that's one way of looking at teeth, I suppose. Um, another faculty member, aware of my keen interest in the Middle East and background in Islamic studies, urged me to avoid religious topics for, and here I'm quoting, religion is the cancer of the modern mind. I guess if you don't study it, it will go away too. Another cautioned me about my handicap. I could read Arabic, and I could make an approximation of speaking the literary language. That would keep me, I was told, from dealing with um, the real people in any country I was. I would become the prisoner of school teachers and others. Robert Redfield would turn in his grave since um, school teachers were his bread and butter when he was working in a distant place called Mexico. Uh, this, but knowing literary Arabic was supposedly a, a barrier to understanding the, I'm quoting, deep structure of how people really think. We would look with excitement at hints of field work, such in as in Victor Turner's essay, Muchona the Hornet, republished in 1967, but it came out, as I recall, in a book edited by Joseph Campbell around 1960, in which Muchona is padding perkily alongside a dusty road. Uh, and then got, I'm quoting there, I usually don't use the words padding perkily, um, and uh, he was compared to an Oxford dumb. Great. That's deal, man, not the, not the beginning of the day. Um, um, what you couldn't find is any reference to the colonial situation. And nobody wrote about that in any direct way. So it was with great excitement that in 1967, we quickly latched on to the sole copy in Chicago, the craft of social anthropology that was um, 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 edited by Arnold Epstein, um, in which a number of the essays were quite helpful to us. But even there, very little was said about the colonial context in any way. It's only after his death in 1999 that I read in a British obituary an account of how Epstein himself was deemed as a subversive in what is now Zambia because it was felt that he was saying good things about labor unions amongst Africans, which obviously was against political interests at the time. Um, I, could, I could go on, but the point that I'm making is that the, the elephant in the room, it's a rather dead metaphor, uh, was not being talked about, and that's the political context in which anthropological knowledge was taken. Uh, there's a Robert I, I had a, when television stations still had to, um, uh, for reasons of their license, have non-profit programs. I had something called Sunrise Semester, which the people could make up on and said, um, normally if you have a program that doesn't have a lot of viewers, we throw it off the air eight to ten weeks. But you've got 48 weeks for Sunrise Semester which was really great. But Bob Fernia was one of the people I brought on the program, and he, uh, um, uh, and he said that he had a conversation with Evans Pritchard, where Evans Pritchard was a fluent, apparently a fluent speaker of Arabic, and had been teaching at Fuad the first university, and had done field work in Siwak, an oasis in Egypt's western desert. Um, uh, he said that he decided to not work in the Arab world because that would have required 
doing something with historians and people in other disciplines. Whereas if he worked in South Sudan, he could do the sort of work that was more favored by anthropologists, the you know, Durkheimian sort of quote, elementary, uh, elementary society. Um, in some ways, when I think back about my first field work, um, it's kind of very different from what anybody going into the field now would have. Um, I was learning language in Cairo part of the time, usually a rather noisy city even then, and much more so now, except when Um Pulson would sing and that, that. The level of traffic noise would, drop, would just really drop. And Gamal Abdel Nasser, of course, would speak after her. She was kind of a warm up uh, uh, to her. And one could mingle with people in lots of different places. Uh, um, <coughs> Yeah, nobody, uh, very few people had, I'm not, I can't even recall whether there was television at the time. There might have been, but if so, very few people had it. I'd go to a uh, vacant lot in Roxy, Masakadida, and have the privilege of watching um, old black and white films, which I couldn't understand the word of, very fast Egyptian colloquial, and in which each tarbouche was carefully painted out. Uh, but um, I had a neighbor, a refugee from Port Said, who loved to trans retranslate for me into a basic Arabic. Um, and most people, as Andrew Shryock said much later, had seen all the old black and white films so that when I could get people to talk to me about what they were saying to one another in these old, worn out films, it was great fun. Um, by 1967, I made up my mind to go to Iraq. And I got there briefly, technically as a social anthropologist attached to an archaeological mission. Although um, what I wanted to do, which was explained to the pre-Bath government in 1968, uh, was to spend two years at the Hausa Najaf. Despite the warning that religion was the cancer of the modern mind, I wanted to be in a madrasa for two years. And it was an exciting time frightening time, and, and I was aided in not being too frightened because I didn't really know that much about the politics of Iraq, except to notice that I would walk into a room and a lot of people would run out of the room, although I did not think of myself as much of a threat, but I was aware how much of a threat people might be under as the government is changing. Um, the glorious revolution of June 1968 term glorious is not mine, it's translated from Arabic. And the corrective action in July slowed me down, but in the best Iraqi tradition, people from the embassy, yeah, the Iraqi embassy in Cairo, tutored me in Iraqi colloquial while I was waiting. And our little code, which took me a while to figure out, was all the talk about the uncle's ulcer. And when the uncle's ulcer got better, they said, now it's time to give you a visa to go to Iraq, so then I figured it out. These were relatives of people I had been studying Arabic with who helped me. Um, I'll pass over the few cues you had for things in Karada Miriam, which is now the green zone, but the radio station was also there, and I was living there in the British Archaeological Mission. Every morning I'd take a walk, and you go by the radio station. If the soldiers there from three different kinds of you know, I never figured out who was who, but three different units did not have clips in their ammunition belts, then I figured it was a good day. If they had ammunition in some machine guns and rifles, then I figured something might be going on, and it might be good to stay at home and read in the library. Um, the, um, the politics of where we could work and where we could not are just as bad, were just as bad then as I believe uh, they, they are today. Uh, in 1975, I um, applied for National Science Foundation grant, or 74, and was roundly rejected. Um, I felt very bad about it. I was told that, oh, you want to study religious intellectuals. There's no such thing. There's just a bunch of dead and dying old men that have no influence in society. So yeah, anthropology at NSF was fine. Later I learned, uh, not very much later, that no male had 
received a National Science Grant for that year. So like Raput Poirot, I got a whiff, perhaps, of academic politics. Stanley Tambaya, from Harvard University at the time, appealed the decision, and he got the, the uh, decision not to award him a grant reversed. So he got his grant, but without funding, since, of course, the money had been spent up. Um, and uh, great moments of history. And I have permission to say this. I think I do, because I told her, give her permission to share a letter I wrote her and others. When I became a kind of a grant examiner in 1980 with Marilyn Waldman, who's an historian, somebody called Shahla Hatney, who some of you know quite well, is applying for a Social Science Research Council grant to go to um, Iran. And Marilyn and myself had a little pre-conference before we let her into the room, as we with anybody else. How were we going to say no to her? Because yeah, it was too dangerous and everything else. Um, she's lucky she didn't have the National Science Foundation to deal with. Uh, uh, she was so persuasive that she got the grant. And we argued to the next level up that she'd be able to, she'd be able to do it. Well, she lasted for three months rather than the ask for one year, but in retrospect, that's pretty good uh, because we were beginning to enter a time in which for private funding, again in the wisdom of short-term financing and thinking in the United States, Social Science Research Council, uh, probably the largest, in, in the 19, early 50s, the largest funder of social science research in the United States decided to pull out of anthropology and field work and area studies because they felt such things were no longer needed because the rational choice people could take over. As uh, somebody said uh, at the time, why do you need to know Japanese or anything about Japan's history and culture if the methods of rational choice will explain why Japanese politicians and bureaucrats do the things they do? Brilliant. Um, uh, so the funding becomes a very awkward uh, sort of thing. The sort of things that people do has radically changed. One can almost in one sleep talk about the ethnography of the 50s and 60s. Name your place, Baitim, a village in Jordan. What's the region? What's the wider sort of things? That's usually a very short chapter. Um, Anthropologists, we could say at the time, would work on small canvases, but would ask a bigger question. But sometimes the canvas, as I indicated with the Kurdia example of, of, of what Evans Pritchard said to him, the canvas would be manipulated. In other words, sometimes you would want to indicate that somewhere you were working in was really smaller and more self-contained than it was because of the nature of the field. There were breaks in this. Lloyd Fowler's, uh, he wrote, you know, it was published in 1974, but he wrote it earlier, Social Anthropology of a Nation State. It was one of the first studies of Turkey which tried explicitly to look at the question of, the, of how anthropologists would work. Now, is the Middle East work more politicized today than it was in the past? I'm not so sure. We can look at the older ethnographies and see little hints of what's left out. There's a photograph, as I recall, in um, uh, Evans Pritchard's Newer Religion, uh, showing a uh, shrine, which was bringing the various groups of the Newer together, kind of on a parallel to what Muslims were doing in the northern Sudan, just before it was bombed by the British Air Force. Um, uh, which would suggest that Evans Pritchard probably knew about politics more than he was saying. Edmund Leach's political systems of Highland Burma doesn't mention anything except one or two sentences in the introduction of World War II, the fact that Leach was a British intelligence officer trying to figure out how to get the Kachin uh, to work with the British, not with the Japanese. These days, we're much more explicit about what we are doing. You would search up and down the ethnographies concerning Morocco, a place where I did my first field work in the late 60s and early 70s, 
for much discussion about politics in any significant way. For that, you'd have to go to John Waterbury's Commander of the Faithful, but he's not a card-carrying anthropologist. And his work was banned in Morocco, but that wouldn't stop the Ministry of the Interior from commissioning a private translation. But in the way of many authoritarian governments, the Moroccan government, the Ministry of the Interior, didn't notice that the book was being translated into French anyway. And they could have bought it for much less money. And the source of that is John Waterbury, who met the translator for the Ministry of the Interior on the beach. And she was very happy to spend some in Morocco translating this work. Um, now, um, Max Weber in 1913 said something that resonates, I think, just as strongly today. The social sciences presuppose an appreciation of the possibility that our ultimate values might diverge, whether in this country we're leftist or right or anything else. And these divergences might be in principle and irreconcilably. But he went on to say, and he was viciously attacked in Germany for saying this, that social scientists should take up heated issues but as analysts, not as propagandists, explicitly or implicitly for one side or the, or the other. This is a constant sort of thing, I think, in anthropology. Um, we've all read, probably, at least those of us in anthropology trade, the work of Pierre Bourdieu. Uh, he had a very important book on, called The Algerians, and the Cassage, What Do I Know, series of French. It first came out in 1958, when the Algerian issue was really heating up. And then re, um, uh, reissued, not reissued, reworked for 1962, when Algeria became independent. And later, one of the classic things that everybody learned in anthropology was his article on the Qabil house, the structure of the basic Berber household. And I was as duped as anybody else, just because I was reading on North Africa, it's nothing. I figured that's because he had worked in Kabil villages. Not quite. He worked in fortified villages, as the Americans called fortified hamlets, places to which people were brought and rounded up where the French could watch over them at night to make sure they'd be comfortable. And uh, his, his work done with an Algerian, mostly, uh, was very much about imagined villages. It would have been nice to have shared a little bit more information about the, politic, the context of politics at the time. What do good anthropological projects look like today? What are they likely to become? Let me just mention a few and give a sense of what I see as the most promising sort of careers about it. Let me take somebody of an older generation, first of all, Susan Shlimovich. How many people have read anything by Susan in this room? Um, one of, she began her life working on the Beni Halal epic. It's a long kind of oral history thing of, the, uh, uh, of Egypt. And moved on to a number of places to work, perhaps her most just the older, most distinguished book would be Objects of Memory, about um, an Arab village in Israel where the inhabitants in 1948 agreed to surrender, or not to fight the uh, Israeli Jews. And uh, then one day they were asked to evacuate their village, oh, just, just overnight so that the army could have an exercise there. Uh, they still haven't been allowed back. They had to set up tents on a hill overlooking uh, their village. And what Susan did was to contact the, era, the villagers still in Israel and those overseas about the places they had. And the eviction was to allow Eastern European refugees who were artists to form an art colony in the same place. She talked to both sides and kept the balance on. Uh, it on it as far as we could. Uh, she had lost some of her own uh, family in the Holocaust, and so she had a very uh, acute sense of things. She's worked on Palestinian drama in places like Jerusalem, and now on the performance of human rights in Morocco, a published book. It's come out in French, which is very well known 
uh, amongst those who read French in Morocco. What other sorts of things do you have? Here's more recent work, which might be the sort of thing which any graduate student would aspire to reading to get ideas for the day. Let me just to choose two on Egypt, since that's a better known country, but we could, if anybody's reading with me tomorrow, talk about any more. Amira Nittelmeyer, uh, who's written a book called Dreams That Matter, uh, which is about the different interpretations of dreams in Egypt by religious scholars uh, uh, who specialize in such things, and by those Egyptians who can afford a Western-style Jungian analysis or just about anything else. And looking at the spectrum of these things, because a lot of these dreams become eminently political and, uh, and are seen as promulgations of other things. It won about six prizes this last year. I can't even count to all the prizes. The Victor Turner Prize, the Beards Prize, the This Prize, the That. It's a, a good book to think about because of the rapid shift in perspectives that she gets in without slowing one down into the, the obligatory anthropological first two chapters about how to read uh, all the books I've read for my thesis. Um, Jessica Vinegar, if I'm saying her name right, uh, who has a book on contemporary art in Egypt where you have to get beyond chapter one in some ways, where you do have all the things my graduate advisors told me. Uh, but once you get beyond that, you have a brilliant account of the world of Egyptian artists and what they have to do in addition to uh, you know, doing something in paintings or the plastic arts, such as sculpture or anything else, and the context that no longer are limited to a place called Egypt, but can just as well be a, the decision of a curator in the greater New York area, because she had a second life as a curator for a while, uh, which helps. Um, anthropology might be a little bit like being a firefighter. What matters a lot, I would argue, is having really good training and I would argue, unlike some anthropologists, really good formation in language to the extent that you have an idea of where you're going. And you won't be able to manage everything. What language is you're supposed to know from Morocco, for instance? Just Arabic might not help you if you're working in the reef or in southern Morocco or other places. There's other languages. Very hard to find talk in the United States or anything, but it's a good start. Uh, or, uh, or in other places, and for those of you who do know Arabic, you're very aware that knowing uh, Arabic, like school teacher Arabic, as I did at the beginning, isn't much help when you start hearing people in Damascus talk among themselves, uh, or people in Egypt or in Morocco. There was once president of meeting between a Moroccan publisher and an Iraqi publisher in the and the common language had to be English because um, the, the Iraqi had been educated in Britain and he couldn't rise to the level of the Moroccan who, uh, uh, who could manage a few more languages than, he, uh, than he, uh, he would be able to do. But when an anthropologist, I would like to think, aspires to be properly trained or has a certain amount of humility about what he does, he or she doesn't know, then it's, I think, uh, then it's possible to take advantage of the situation of the um, I was at a meeting of the American Anthropological Association last November, and there was a panel on the Arab Spring, and I must say, it didn't grab me that much to hear somebody say, well, I was calling my mother every day in Cairo, and she didn't know much of what was going on outside of her apartment building. Well, that's good news, I guess. Um, yeah. One learned a little bit. One, it was, it, one doesn't have to wait for arguments. But in good ethnography, I think there's something between the really circumstantial and then the sort of paper where you say, that all this talk about waves in Tahrir Square, police waving in, and of demonstrators going back reminds me of Bodhi Yad or some 
preferably a French scholar you can quote, and the poetry of opposition and so forth. You just try that in Tahrir Square sometime and see how far that gets you in some ways. Uh, what you can have, and you get in the best of ethnographies, is a sense of all the competing voices in many of these places without amputating the intellectuals or others. Uh, when I was in Syria the first time, I had uh, something I wasn't quite prepared for. I, my phone rang in the middle of the night, and somebody, a voice whom I recognized, said, are you awake? And I figured, well, in Syria, the proper thing is if you answer the phone, say, yes, I'm awake. That's true. Um, and I came down to the lobby where there was somebody who I didn't recognize and wasn't introduced, who was very polite, as a certain type of Syrian would be, um, who uh, turned out to be the head of security for the Ba'ath Party. And he asked me what I was doing there, and I basically said in Arabic that, well, I, I said, I'm told as an American that Syria is a terrorist state. And yet, I'm finding the most exciting publications on religion to take place to take place in Damascus, and not elsewhere. And I'm here to ask you, Mother, why? And I want to talk to publishers, and if I can, censors, poets, and others, on this question. Why? Two days later, I was told, now you have your inoculation. You can do whatever you want. And uh, some people from the Ba'ath Party, they're very structured. They had the, the cultural section of the Ba'ath Party. They'd take me around, I'd meet the Ba'ath people, and I could meet others trying to survive on their own and get a good sense. And I learned about the distinction between books sold above the table and under the table in bookstores. I'd go into a bookstore and say, I'd like a copy of such and such a title, and I'd have someone from the Ba'ath Party with me. Uh, something then was a bestseller called Secrets of the Druze. And he said, it's not on our shelves, the bookseller would say. And I said, that's not what I asked you. I said, is it in this room? Dr. Tawala, under the table. <laughs> and there were about six boxes of the book there. Uh, but uh, the person I was in with uh, knew that. And I learned something about the gray area between something being permitted and something not being officially, officially banned. Uh, let, me, let me stop here. Any sort of training you get from the best of the anthropologists of the prior generation or what you can learn from colleagues, because more and more now you will have amongst your, your midst people who are from the area that you want to talk about. Uh, is probably going to be out of date or a little bit about out of focus before you go. Uh, but what you have to do is to recognize the breadth of the field uh, in which you may be called to operate. In some places, uh, I know for a fact, certainly not at Boston University, anthropologists are told just read anthropologists, otherwise you'll get confused. If you want to work in the Middle East, I would strongly advise against that. You're not going to become an historian at the same time, but you're probably going to have a number of complementary disciplines and fields that you're going to want to know about and attend to get a good sense of. And you're going to want to be much more aware than would have been the case half a century ago of multiple audiences, of not just other people in the trade, but your first book, those people who will assess you for promotion and tenure, uh, but at the same time, the people about whom you are writing. Um, English used to be a language of privilege, where only the elite would learn it. Now, many, many more people do. And the chances are, before you go to see anybody, they're going to Google you one way or another. And the chances are much better than in book reviews, in newspapers, and eventually books, if you have a good way of writing. Uh, you will be translated and should be. And the excitement there is you really learn something about multiple audiences at that time. Thank you very much.
the unfolding developments in places like Syria, for example, which is uh, not the same your comments on the minds of many of us. Um, where, where do you think, where do you think one can find uh, if you know, inspiring material for a case like Syria, where we're dealing with a regime that seems to be in many ways at war with its population? And what, what, what would be on your bookshelf that you would recommend as, a, as an appropriate uh, if you know, starting point to get some leverage on what's going on? I would think of two books in French, one of which I've read, the other of which I have to, I can recall the title of. The, the book only came out two months ago, and I, I, I have a disease I'm called departmental chair, uh, which means my reading is going to slow down. It's a handicap that we endure, but all things will pass. Uh, one book is called, uh, the, the most recent book is The Ba'ath and the Ulama, and it's The Ba'ath Party of Syria. It's in French. Uh, just came out. It's a single authored book by an anthropologist, a student of Gilles Capel, who's been translated quite a bit into English, who um, basically has spent long periods of time in Syria and who has the language capacity. To Thomas Hello. Hmm? Hello. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the other would be uh, Bernard Rogier, uh, whose uh, first book is published by Harvard University Press, and whose title is Everyday Jihad. Everyday Jihad, dealing with um, uh, uh, dealing with the views of Palestinians in refugee camps in Lebanon. Uh, I'm not aware of any American who's had sustained the to keep going back to these camps. So uh, I know Bougier. And when you're told, don't come back here again, you might be dead. Um, he still would trust other people enough to say, well, that might be true anywhere, and keep going back. Uh, it's not encouraged. Uh, don't, you know, don't by many. But he has a uh, second book that just came out again very recently in French, uh, not every day jihad, but it's a book about the politics in northern Lebanon, which has quite a bit to do, if you read between the lines, with um, uh, the sort of support that Syrians in the contiguous borders with, with Lebanon can get from outside in which they need to continue the sort of resistance that we're reading about at the present time. These are people who have done sustained work under difficult circumstances. Now, not about Syria, but about Gaza. If somebody said to me, well, I want to think about Gaza and what's going on there, then I would say, well, look at the work of the Tetia Bukai, French again. Uh, uh, who uh, spent a considerable period of time in Gaza working with an NGO, but for the purpose of conducting computer research. She's a political scientist, but if you gathered by now from what I'm saying, uh, political science in France is perhaps closer to anthropology in the United States, or social anthropology, uh, than is the French discipline of ethnology or Anthropology, sociology also exists, but it's kind of in remission for most of the Middle East. Uh, not elsewhere, but for the Middle East, it sounds a whole it's these are the people who do things. Uh, there, there are some works in English on Syria that come out at different times. In fact, one of my former undergraduate students, Krista Salamandra, uh, wrote a, a, a very good book on. Uh, Syrian television, especially soap operas, and what Syrians could do in that range of things where they could have creative expression. As she says, one of the problems of being a writer for television in Syria, you can, how many times can you do family dramas as opposed to anything else? If you want police dramas on television reaching wide audiences, you have to go to Morocco, where it's the only Arab country I know there's a little bit in Egypt where you have crime serials done with the population of 
that that's work that's just on the horizon in terms of both population. Uh, I'm sorry, you want to ask a question? Uh, I'll preface my remark, Dale, with uh, since you, you went a little bit into your own past, I'll preface it just with a little bit of a, a shared past. Um, because it is almost to the week 30 years since I met you. And I want to follow up on a comment that Richard made about the support that you provided for um, young scholars in the field. Of course, I was a Southeast Asianist, not a Middle Easternist. But um, I, was, uh, I had just defended my dissertation in November of 1981 at the University of Michigan and was uh, working as Clifford Pierce's assistant, which she never really did not involve any other than just hanging out. And uh, feeling very sort of out of my element, not knowing where I was going to go and you know, being on the job market, it was a difficult job market then. And, um, like to do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you came to, the, this was at the Institute for, the Advan for Advanced Studies, and uh, you came to see Cliff and to my astonishment, had, uh, had uh, made arrangements to meet with me. And uh, this was the first time that anything like this happened in my life. And uh, it was just such a remarkable gesture from a senior, well, mid-career, but certainly very, very distinguished scholar. It, uh, it stayed, it was a lesson. I don't know that I've implemented it, but I certainly recall it throughout my life, the way in which you, you reached out to me. And I've watched you do it with many, many a uh, young scholar, a young dissertation writer over the course of subsequent years. And I, I just say that as a preface to, uh, to just second what Richard said. You're, you're the way in which you've reached out again and again and again over the course of your career is really, really exceptional. You're a real teacher and, uh, and mentor in all senses of the word to, to those of us who work in the Muslim world. A briefer comment now question. Uh, I'm working with Carol Ferrar right now. We're rereading. I of course read reread it several times, your knowledge and power in Morocco. But since uh, Carol and I are going to be talking about your book tomorrow, I've just been doing an independent study with her. I thought I'd just sort of do an easy setup for her and perhaps she can she can follow up. But if you went back to that will that book, which I consider one of the most exquisitely beautiful ethnographies of knowledge written from any part of the world, any part of the world. Uh, if you went back and revisited that and looked at the life history that you tell there, you tell the history of a world and a tradition of knowledge in change, in, in the process of far-reaching changes, from the point of view, of course, of the Qadi, whose life you analyze and you present so vividly and movingly, you also make use his life to talk about the way in which knowledge education, socialization, or changing in Morocco and across the broader Middle East. And of course, you, in subsequent years, you stood back and made broader statements about knowledge traditions and the changing nature of education all across broad expanses of the Middle East. But if you just return to that book and the life of the Qadi, who you described there, uh, what would be the epilogue to the world that was lost there and the world that was emerging what would be the, the epilogue that you would write as an anthropologist at that level of intimacy using the life of that person? What would you, what epilogue would you write to that account? I would say that it is in one way, it's a nice resonating praise you have. I suppose it is about a world that was lost. In another way, it's not, because most Moroccans would say that they are, in a different way, preserving that past or bringing it up to date. Now, that's not quite the case. When you have a system outside of U.S. medical education where you spend one year memorizing body parts, as far as I can tell. Um, the, um, uh, when you are able to become, first of all, a reciter of the program, is a very specialized sort of activity, which it wasn't before, but it's still an iconic sort of knowledge. 
the places where I see that iconic sort of knowledge continuing are places like the, um, it's not the full-time job, but the tutors to very elite children who are part of the palace. Now, I know some of them, I've known them in other settings, but it's where people can afford to be patrons of them and where they go out to do something that was not available earlier. How do they, uh, uh, where do you show distinction in this if you're part of the Hassaniya uh, um, kind of school of learning? You go out to an international Quran recitation, recitals, and you know, prompts, mm -hmm. and you come back. Uh, but when I talk to these people, I talk to them a bit about that, and they've got a very beautiful way of, of reciting. But I'll get the same questions from palace students as from others. Do you think I could get to America? Can you get me a scholarship? And things like that. By the way, before, uh, thank you for your comments on the discussion in 1981. Uh, one of the reasons you want to talk with students such as Bob is you get other doors open in longer term. In 1985, I was invited to uh, Indonesia by the Indonesians, but since they don't have any money, they got money from the U.S. Embassy. And somebody had seen me uh, keep a riot from breaking out at UNESCO in a discussion where a very left-wing person decided that she was being attacked. So she brought in her own guerrillas, as the translators call them, who scribbled their names on little place cards to put over the people that you have for the others and helped keep them calm, not in the American way, which would mean call the LA police and bring the night stakes, but some other way. And so um, somebody who was then the undersecretary of Islamic studies um, um, said he'd like to invite me. And then the American embassy said, no, absolutely not. We don't want him. And he said, well, then there's going to be no American at the first ever conf international conference in Islam and politics in the country. So they got your mind. So they invited me. And then I made a deal with the um, Indonesians. Sure, I'll come, but you have to allow me to go to um, the Tengger Highlands, where I know this anthropologist who is there in the summer. And so I got to walk above the clouds, literally, uh, in there. But my way was paved by the Indonesians keeping their word and letting the authorities know that I was coming. It's okay, you don't have to do too much reporting or anything else. And there was something that Bob may or may not recall. We were sitting in a little hut in the middle of the field waiting for, this is why you want to learn language well, um, waiting for a headman to come back. We were sitting in his place, and there's a gentleman with a crease at the window beginning to foam at the mouth. And I noticed this, and Bob said, um, I think because of our skin color, he thinks that we are demons of some sort. And so later Bob reconstructed it because my ability to distinguish levels of speech in Indonesian was not very good. It doesn't exist. And he spoke to him in a more authoritative way than others. And so the phone diminished and I went away. And the thing is, if you have to say, quick, get me my interpreter, that might not have been the thing <laughs> to do. And Bob's lesson for me was the next time you read one of these Clipperdard statements about how calm and kind of otherworldly the Indonesians and I remember the guy at the window <laughs> looking in. Um, and I also. Uh, just by context, got a sense of Bob's ability and language, which I could get from other contexts as well. Then we could play a shell game because I could go into mosques and I could read the some things in Arabic better than the mosque teacher. But of course, I couldn't say that when I'd ask questions in Arabic and the guy would answer. And so the mosque teachers would be very happy. So, yeah. so thank you. There's a reciprocity you can learn from people. Now, you were being set up for a question. <laughs> oh, dear. No, okay. but... Well, then, I, sure, I would come up with something. Let's see. Um, how would you think that education now in Morocco, then, is being used as a form of, as a form of power 
in the sense that it's obviously led a lot of young people to nothing. So how is the mental construction of what it means to be educated changing in the clients that are around? Parts of the education system have a but some of the senior administrators who are accident of my own cohort, um, I know, will point out to me, at least in private, when our system works, it's not because institutionally it's functioning. functioning. Um, it is working because of individual initiatives. Uh, in our own field, anthropology, I remember dealing with students in Morocco in 1992, where I was running a seminar in Arabic, but my own reason to run it was not just to run it in Arabic. It was either that or going to Jordan to take Arabic language lessons to improve my Arabic, and I figured, why not just jump in and swim and see what happens? And some students asked to join us at the university, and their teachers said, get out. And when I met the students in the corridor, they asked me very politely, can we meet with you somewhere? Later, the other said, don't do it. There might be police spies. And I said, that's kind of good, because I want to see the sort of questions police spies would ask. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so we'd meet at my apartment. They'd say, better watch it, and so forth. And there are a number of people where, with some of them, I've stayed in touch. Guess what? It's just like, but not just like here. It's harder. A number dropped out or had to go into the Ministry of the Interior to do other things, because you know how many jobs are there doing anthropology or something. But I would get a good idea of how they operated. Little photocopies of this and that around, because nobody could afford the books, but they could afford the photocopies and shared information on things and so forth. And some of them survived and are now teaching. And the last time I went back, I was very happy. There was a long period where nobody was doing sociology, anthropology really doesn't exist at the university, except as part of sociology. Um, and I was told during an exam here, oh, can you come by? There's just four or five students. And there were about 45 there. And I had a chance to ask people what they were doing. And they were adapting students. In other words, if you were working in the Ministry of Health, I'm doing social work, surprise, that would be your field work and you'd be reflecting on it for your courses and your practical work with nothing else to do. You know, the standard thing and in Morocco, you know, we, uh, for my generation, in fact, at New York University, we were told no one <coughs> can study, quote, their own people. You had to study somewhere else. Uh, that no longer is the case. But in Morocco, if you were from Algerida, that's about the only place you're going to be able to do field work because you will be taken as a police spy much more than an alien would be uh, for working anywhere else. It'd be tremendous hostility. Uh, but you would see a number of people with pretty good projects and others trying to get an idea of where the projects were. And you're beginning to get books in Arabic that are not hand-me-down translations from French or English um, that are concerning anthropology, and some of them are pretty good. Book circulation in the Arab world remains the worst of anywhere in the world except perhaps Antarctica. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's really bad between the censors and book distribution, piracy, and everything else. The economics for it just don't work. And, uh, and I, I, but um, uh, I, I would like to think that it's not going to stay that way forever. Yes, please. Thank you. Could I perhaps ask you to reflect on IRB processes and how this relates to both anthropology and other disciplines, the institutional review boards and you know, studies with human subjects? I missed your keyword. <coughs> IRB. Did the you say? IRB process and how it relates both to anthropology and to other disciplines. It's a good question. Um, I'm of two minds. Uh, I used to be on the IRB at New York University. And uh, they're, they're very much, uh, IRBs are still pretty well dominated by medical people. I'm glad to say that a lot of medical people are very open in things, but it does take somebody who knows about non-medical approaches to things, especially where 
I, I, I mean, it, it, it would almost be the subject of a good Egyptian um, drama or a good Iranian drama to say to somebody, hello, I'm your friendly American anthropologist, would you mind signing this human consent form for my IRB so I could ask you a few questions? I'll promise you anonymity, don't worry, trust me. Uh, it doesn't work that way, to say the least. Uh, uh, it's, but most IRB groups will know that. Sometimes in my editorial capacity, I'll see things in between, like somebody going into a university setting and asking permission from students to do certain things, but then treating anything faculty members would say is fair game, even where faculty members could say that there are certain things that might get them expelled from certain countries in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, how that gets handled is something I won't talk about here, but it's, it's basically part of the peer review system. Um, it is awkward. A lot of people are more resistant than others to this. But when you get doctors talking, those long forms that people sign anyway to get medical care, especially if they can't afford to pay for doctors, are, are not necessarily understood. You know, uh, doctors will say to me informally, they'll say to the patient, oh, just sign here. Yeah. Um, then we can get on and treat you or something. And then, you know, they're, 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 uh, most people are aware of the process. Most people enter it in good faith. Um, that's, that's about the best I can say. But it's a very American notion still. Um, perhaps some of you with a lot to do with Europe can tell me otherwise, but uh, I'm not quite aware of the French going to the same levels for social science research and for other things. And uh, the British, the less said the better. Yeah. And we thanks to you, uh, the IRB president. We progress. Uh, it's been a real nightmare last year, so. Yeah. You mean it was a nightmare here? Here. It's better than it was a year or two ago. We got divorced from the medical school. Okay, we've had, both, both at NYU and elsewhere, uh, when I was on the uh, NYU board, a very interesting thing where I would pick up an anomaly of what looked like, I can say it now, a uh, doctor who was selling body parts or tissues from patients. And uh, by the book, this is what it was, but it turned out to be one of the few doctors uh, in the NYU system, uh, or uh, you know, coming through the IRB there, willing to treat uh, uh, what we now call HIV patients. Everybody else would shun them. It was a dentist, in fact. And uh, what got us through that, and as, as you all know, IRBs are not just medical personnel or anything else because of American excesses in places like the Tuskegee experiment or Guatemala or uh, US Army experiments to see how people would act to being downwind from radiation exposure and so forth. Um, one of the medical people explained to us what was going on. The doctor was probably dealing with, um, or probably dealing with an impoverished population who couldn't pay and there was a market in the selling of tissues, which is probably the only way that people could get treatment. And so uh, we, uh, the IRB did what it's supposed to do. It's like what a jury does. If you hear a jury that says it's going to send somebody away for life for, for the third violation of pot smoking, I've been on grand juries where you simply refuse to hear the evidence. So you just say there's no evidence and the prosecutor will glare at you and will say, sorry, you're tampering with the grand jury, get out. Uh, but in this case, uh, we would, I would like to think, answered in terms of, quote, the common good. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a case where it worked a little better. But I can well imagine another IRB just by the chemistry of the groups uh, doing quite the opposite. Sorry, it looks like it happened to you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, no, not really, but I'm trying to reflect on my own discipline. In political science, there are basically two competing views on IRBs. Uh, basically, people who do political ethnography, they are more in terms of, okay, I mean, it would be good to have a sort of a software IRB process. Whereas the more sort of orthodox mainstream political science people would think IRB is good both for you and for your subjects, which is which becomes very hard for people who try to do either political ethnography or more qualitatively or at work in political science. Uh, so that's why okay. I'm trying to Thank you and good luck. <laughs> yeah, I want to uh, thank you for a number of fascinating insights and I I want to suggest that at this point, perhaps we adjourn to a reception where we can continue this informally. So please uh, join me in thanking Gail Eichelman. <laughs>